All right, folks, it's uh, 3.01. I'm going to take the liberty of calling the Finance Committee to order. So the first order of business is we're going to have a presentation by the General Manager of Finance and Technology. I assume, Cam, you're going to be presenting it today. So you're our auditor, not the GM of Finance. So, Cam, please uh, feel free to uh, walk us through uh, Corporate Report F006. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm pleased to present to the Finance Committee Corporate Report F006, which outlines the proposed 2017 to 21 financial plan for the general operating budget. Corporate Report F006 recommends that the Finance Committee recommend to Council to approve the recommendations outlined in Section 4 entitled New Funding Requirements of this report and to direct staff to prepare the 2017 five-year financial plan for the years 2017 to 21 inclusively for the general operating budget and the roads and traffic utility, incorporating the recommendations outlined in this report. Uh, Section 2 background. In January of 2016, Council approved the 2016 five-year financial plan. This plan included direction for the years 2017 to 2020 as well. The proposed 2017 to 21 financial plan has incorporated this direction and has also included additional priorities that Council has identified during the 2016 fiscal year. Full details of the assumptions, directions, and priorities are outlined in the following sections of this corporate report. Section 3, general discussion. Section 3 is comprised of three subsections that describe three key priority, priority areas for Council in relation to the financial plan. The three areas include, number one, public safety, which is comprised of police services, fire services, bylaw services, and the public safety office. Number two, staffing capacity. This includes all corporate staffing requirements, excluding the public safety. And number three, the capital, city capital program. So I will now present some de more details in each respective section as it relate to the proposed 2017 financial plan. So moving on to section 3.1-1, police services. The adopted uh, 2016 financial plan incorporated an increase of 16 RCMP members, bringing the total RCMP complement to 819. This is inclusive of Surrey's share of the integrated teams. The proposed 2017 financial plan includes the annualization of these 16 members. The adopted 2016 financial plan also includes a proportionate increase in civilian support staff, bringing the total support staff to 298. The proposed 2017 financial plan also includes funding to analyze the support, cast, support staff on a permanent basis. The 2017 financial plan includes an additional 12 RCMP members to be added in 2017, bringing the total to 831 members. The proposed 2017 to 21 five-year financial plan also includes the addition of 16 RCMP members per year for the years 2018 to 21 inclusively of the financial plan. Alternatively, Council may wish to support an equivalent allocation of resources to meet the diverse needs of the public safety strategy. The increase in RCMP members in the proposed 2017 financial plan is accompanied by a relative increase in civilian support staff. The proposed 2017 financial plan includes funding to be effective October 1st of every fiscal year for both members and for civilian staff. The proposed 2017 financial plan also includes new additional funding of $159,000 for DNA analysis. This financial responsibility was downloaded to local governments from the province last year. Total funding for DNA for 2017 in the proposed plan is $469,000. Additional details on the financial requirements related to the RCMP included in the proposed 2017 financial plan is included in Section 4 of this report, which we will discuss shortly. Section 3.1-2, Fire Services. Fire Services added an executive assistant in 2016. Full year funding for this position has been included in the proposed 2017 financial plan. The Fire Services proposed budget also includes 
a increase of 2.4 million to, co to allow for the general contract increase that fire services has in place. 3.1-3, by law enforcement services. In July 2015, the police committee, now known as the Public Safety Committee, approved a transition plan as outlined in Corporate Report P006, entitled Community Safety Patrol Update. The plan centered around hiring of four community patrol officers that would focus on the Newton Town Center with a strong focus on engagement and visual presence in the local area. The program has now been active for over a year, and based on feedback from citizens, local businesses, and staff, including the manager of bylaws, the program is a great success. Accordingly, the proposed 2017 financial plan includes permanent funding for the community patrol officers on an ongoing basis. The proposed 2017 financial plan also includes the addition of three new bylaw officers effective June of 2017 and one bylaw support clerk effective January 1st of 2017. Section 3.1-4, the proposed 2017 financial plan also includes $25,000 per year for a new public safety dashboard that will enhance the city's communication to all stake stakeholders, including citizens. The new dashboard will be used to rebrand and relaunch the sustainability dashboard. I will take you to section 3.2, staffing capacity. The 2017 proposed financial plan includes funding requirements for corporate staffing increases, including the operation of new city facilities. Two key examples of, op of new operations will come online and open to the public next year include the museum expansion and the Newton Wave Pool expansion. These staffing requirements are partially offset by revenues gener by, generated by the respective new facility. It is highlighted that additional staffing requirements may be required in 2017 in response to service delivery demands. Typically, these adjustments are offset by directly correlated revenue increases. Examples could include increased delivery due to development activity or parks, rec, and cultural programming offerings. Section 3.3, capital program. The 2017 to 21 five-year capital financial plan, corporate report F005, was presented to the Finance Committee on November the 21st of this year. The Finance Committee was, pre was presented with options of either increasing the capital parcel tax by $10 or approving a 0.54 property tax increase, with other options generating sufficient revenue to support the capital initiatives that were presented. At that time, the Finance Committee approved a 0.54% property tax increase, which has been incorporated into new funding requirements in Section 4.0 below. Uh, section 4.0, new funding requirements. This section of the report uh, summarizes in more detail the funding requirements needed based on Council direction in relation to City priorities. The section is segregated into public safety requirements and other corporate requirements, similar to the previous section, 3.0. 4.1, public safety funding requirements, dash one, RCMP requirements. This section is broken down into two categories, RCMP policing services related to the contract increases and other policing increases. So I will quickly go through each one here. Um, Item number one is the annualization of 16 RCMP member positions that were added in October of this year at $1.013 million. The addition of 12 new RCMP members effective October of next year of 2017 for $327,000. A provision for a 2.5% member salary increase effective January of 16. This is something that's required by the federal government at $1.092 million. An increase in the employer portion of the RCMP pension, $561,000. Increased funding for the integrated teams, $907,000. Increased funding for E-Division administration, $1.942 million. And other general RCMP contract increases of $2.34 million. Items that would be included in this category would be, for example, training costs, fuel costs, costs for cars, vehicle allowances, and information technology as examples. Other policing increases. At the annualization of new civilian staff that were added in 2016, 283,000. 
Addition of three new civilian staff effective October of 2017, uh, $58,000. General civilian staff labor increases of 962,000. Increased DNA costs, which we talked about in section 3.1 of 159,000. And other general operating increases of $440,000. The total RCMP policing service funding requirements as outlined in the proposed financial plan is just over $10 million, 10.084 million. Section 4.1-2, Fire Services. As mentioned earlier, the addition of an executive assistant on a permanent basis, $78,000, and other general labor increases of $2.4 million. Total for fire, $2.485 million for 2017. 4.1-3, Other Public Safety Initiatives. Uh, three new bylaw officers being added June of next year, $95,000. One new bylaw support clerk added in January of 2017, $60,000. Permanent funding for the community patrol, $286,000. And this is in the Newton Town Center. Annualization of the bylaw clerical position that was added previously, $33,000. Other general salary and contract increases of $311,000. And the public safety dashboard that we discussed in section 3.2, $25,000. The total funding requirements for this category is 810,000 and the total public safety requirement, uh, funding requirements in the 2017 proposed plan is $13.379 million. Section 4.2, corporate funding requirements, so this is non-public safety related. General labor, labor increases, excluding public safety, $2.7 million. Third party contract and other increases of 1.757 million. Provision for city inventory increases, 900,000. Net new operating costs, 800,000. And, ex and again, examples of that would be the museum and the Newton Wave Pool expansion. Um, old city hall maintenance, additional funding requirement, 290,000. Uh, net new additional cultural grant increase of 100,000, bringing the total cultural grant to 400,000 per year for 2017. An increase in the contribution to capital from the general operating fund of 1.6 million. Fiscal services, which includes our uh, debt servicing, both internal and external, as well as banking costs, an increase of 1.387 million. Uh, the elimination of the budgeted transfer that we've used historically 4.3 million. That number is reflective of the 2016 adopted financial plan. And the capital program funding support of 1.73 million. This is the equivalent to $10 uh, increase to the capital parcel tax. So the total funding, uh, additional funding required for corporate initiatives is 15.564. And in addition to that, we add the public safety requirements of 3.37 to get a grand total funding requirement of 28. $0.944 million for 2017 in the proposed plan. Section 5, new funding available. So the following are projected revenue increases that are expected to be available to offset the anticipated new funding required in 2017. A general property tax increase will generate $12.757 million. Property tax increase to support the capital program, $1.73 million. Estimated new property tax resulting from new growth in the city, just over $6 million. And net across the board and other revenue changes of $8.4 million. So total funding available, $28.944. Section 6.0, so summary of the proposed. The expenditures um, required for the 2017 financial plan of $28.944. Less the funding available results in a net zero budget. Effectively, the 2017 proposed financial plan represents a balanced budget. Section 7, assumptions applied for the 2017 general operating financial plan. So the following four are key assumptions that were utilized in creating the proposed financial plan. A general property tax increase of approximately $72 for the average single family dwelling. This will predominantly be used to offset increased public safety resourcing and expenditures. 
an increase in roads and traffic levy that is equivalent to approximately $18 for the average single family, family dwelling, a general property tax increase of approximately $10 for the average single family dwelling that will be used to support the capital plan that was presented to the Finance Committee on November 21st, 2016, and a fee increase of 3.9% across the board or equivalent. Section 8.0, the road and traffic safety utility levy. As outlined above in Section 7, the 2017 proposed roads and traffic sa safety operating plan includes an increase of approximately $18 for the average single-family du family dwelling. The new, funding, the new funding generated by the proposed increase will ensure that a stable, sustainable funding source will be available to meet the growing needs of the traffic and, s traffic and safety utility for the city. The Roads and Traffic Safety Utility delivers key services related to the maintenance of roads throughout the entire city, traffic calming measures such as sidewalks, crosswalks, speed bumps and roundabouts, and general education to citizens of the city in relation to traffic and safety. The Roads and Traffic Levy is an assessment based levy and the increase of $18 for the average single family home is in line with the current adopted 2016 to 2020 financial plan. Similar adjustments to the roads and traffic levy are included in each of the remaining years of the proposed 2017 to 21 financial plan. Section 9. In summary, based on the discussion and information provided in this corporate report, F006, it is recommended that the Finance Committee recommend to Council to approve the recommended recommendations made in Section 4.0 of this corporate report. Direct staff to prepare the 2017 to 21 financial plan, incorporating these recommendations as outlined in this report for the general operating financial plan and the roads and traffic safety utility. Mr. Chair, that concludes my presentation for corporate report F006. I've had Suzanne uh, post a chart here um, that displays where the city of Surrey would land relative to other cities given the implementation of the proposed 2017 financial plan for context. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron. And again, the presentation or the, the slide that you're presenting now, um, is it safe to assume none of the other municipalities have been able to uh, uh, put out their 27 municipal tax uh, information? So, in fact, uh, there's a good likelihood that we still could be uh, the lowest. That is correct, Mr. Chair. These are based on 2016 figures. Um, no increases have been incorporated for the remaining cities on that list. Thank you. Thanks, Cam, for that uh, presentation. So we're going to, so uh, Councillor Hain. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, is it appropriate to ask questions specific to the report that we just um, heard? Uh, Councillor Hain, I was going to wait for it until we actually uh, got the corporate reports, if you'd like. Okay, that's fine. We'll wait. Okay. We'll wait till then. If it's that's pressing, great. we can ask nope. now. Nope. So we're, we're going to move to the public consultation uh, portion of the meeting. So this is an opportunity for members of the public and others to provide comments. And I know we've got the Surrey Board of Trade here as well today. So I'm going to ask anyone wishing to come uh, forward to make a presentation, please come forward. And Anita, you'll be our first uh, presenter. Thank you very much, Councillor Gill, Mayor Hepner, and uh, Council members. This is Dr. Greg Thomas, uh, the Chair of our uh, Board of Directors for the Surrey Board of Trade. I'm Anita Huberman, CEO of the Surrey Board of Trade. And uh, we are today presenting you with our perspectives uh, for the 2017 city budget, uh, but really the long-term financial plan for the city of Surrey. And the Surrey Board of Trade, we're an independent uh, voice of business. We're an independent business organization with 2,400 business members that represents around 60,000 employees. And why is the city budget important to us? Well, we want to make sure that we're building Surrey to ensure that investments for Surrey's business community are created for our local economy for today and for the future. As an industry organization, we're mandated to review all government budgets, locally, provincially, and federally. We want to maximize productivity in the economy and encourage growth in the private sector. And the Surrey Board of Trade is a visible, effective organization for the views of our membership and business community. And we're a partner in building our city of Surrey that we're so proud of. 
The city budget is important to the Surrey Board of Trade to evaluate Surrey's tax rates as being conducive for business growth, retention, and infrastructure investments. So Surrey has three major sources of revenue, the most significant of which is property taxes, residential, major industry, light industry, and business. Surrey, in our evaluation, has enhanced moderate general tax increases in 2016 to fund increasing costs related to protective services and other city operations. The city increased the annual property taxes by approximately $70, along with an $18 increase in the road and traffic safety levy for the average single-family dwelling for 2016. In 2015, Surrey generated approximately 30% of its general property tax revenue from business and industry. So building on our perspectives and our evaluation from last year, the foundation of our presentation this year is what do we want as a business community and what do we want our city to be? And so our perspectives are related to investments in the areas of transportation, agriculture, public safety, taxation, red tape reduction, social policy issues, development, and economic development. So our first area, and uh, I think you have our presentation in front of you, is in the area of property taxes, road traffic levy, and strategic investments. The Surrey Board of Trade again supports, with caution, the proposed property tax increase of 3.9% plus the 1% increase for the road and traffic levy. The $10 increase to Surrey's capital parcel tax to help pay for civic amenities is also supported by our organization. Surrey offers one of the lowest tax regimes, as it was just articulated. We need the city, though, to continue investing in infrastructure and amenities to make this a world-class city. And decisions need to be made on the comparative tax threshold. We want a robust civic amenity plan. But does it make sense for us to be the lowest tax regime? Are there other opportunities to derive revenue? We must make strategic investments now, not only in parks and recreation centers, but also cultural corridor investments, convention center uh, infrastructure, and more. The Surrey Board of Trade is committed to, work, committed to working with the city. There may be other ways of collecting revenue other than tax revenue. These are provoking questions, new paradigms for financial planning that must be considered uh, by mayor and council. The second area is transparency and accountability for business taxes. There is an opportunity for the city to enhance transparency by improving communication to businesses on where their tax dollars are going. The Board of Trade is committed to helping the city on this messaging. The Board of Trade over many years has observed, in contrast to other municipal websites across Canada and municipal financial reporting mechanisms, that Surrey does have well-organized, easy-to-read financial documentation. In fact, Surrey has received numerous awards for their financial processes. Third area is social policy. And again, from an economic uh, context, we're asking the city, through their capital budget planning, to consider ways in which to innovatively protect our rental stock of housing, that is, our workforce housing. The city of Surrey may want to explore fast-tracking permits for purpose-built housing. Surrey can use its regulatory process to increase the amount of affordable housing in Surrey by reintroducing an affordable housing levy on new residential developments and or require a percentage of units of affordable housing in new developments. 
Fourth area is development and land use and economic development. There are opportunities to explore additional human capital investments and business attraction tools for the city's economic development department. And the Surrey Board of Trade is also pleased, as per our recommendation last year, to see improvements for developers on streamlined processes. In the area of transportation, as you know, we are continuing to support light rail transit as the preferred solution to move people in a livable community. And we were pleased to work with the city this year on our annual road survey, which I presented options and identified priorities by the business communities on uh, roads, uh, traffic circles that need to be implemented, uh, intersections that could be improved. And so we're looking forward to working with the City of Surrey on their road improvement plan. In the area of public safety, as we articulated last year, we support the increased integration of programs and services focused on reducing crime and specifically providing youth with supportive pro uh, programming to avoid gang-related activity. The city budget last year invested in increasing the RCMP, but again we want to stress as a business organization that this is not the only solution to reducing crime. It requires the involvement of many stakeholders for an ongoing multi-pronged solution. And in the areas of finance and taxation, last year the Surrey Board of Trade asked the city to review the audit committee's use of Charter Section 90, leading to an expansion of the committee's disclosure where appropriate of the city's internal audit reports and external auditor reports. We are asking for an update on this. Secondly, in this area of finance, as we move to being the largest city in British Columbia, a worthwhile collaborative research study is to create a dashboard matrix that can be communicated to residents and businesses on where we are as a city with our population and land base as it relates to other comparable global cities. And the purpose of this is to de really determine the infrastructure and amenity gaps for Surrey. And again, unlike other cities, the Surrey Board of Trade congratulates the City of Surrey on their accounting practices, the presentation of the costs of investments in infrastructure, costs of pension obligations, makes it easier to match the costs and benefits of municipal activities to taxpayers and citizens. The financial results are presented in a timely way. And then finally, in the area of agriculture, we know that one-third of Surrey's land base is agricultural. A recommendation for the city is to work with the province on a farm property tax review. The other item to explore for city revenue growth is a review of taxes on residential class one in the ALR. Are there opportunities to enhance revenues or innovative ways to use land in the agricultural land reserve? There could be an adjustment for valuing agricultural land not used for farming. And then also in the area of agriculture, a review of water usage investments and water infrastructure policies needs to take place, especially in the advent of climate change. So at a very high level, these are our perspectives on the city budget uh, for 2017, and we welcome any questions or comments that you have. Nita, I just want to take this quick opportunity to thank you. It's been a real pleasure working with you and your group over the last year. Uh, I think we've had a lot of success in being able to have some open dialogue in terms of some of the issues that the city's been faced with, and it's been a real pleasure to work with your group. So that being said, I have Councillor LaFranc. Thank you so much. And I would just uh, echo what uh, Councillor Gill has said. Um, it's been great to work with you this year. Uh, I was really appreciative of some of the comments that you made in terms of our uh, social issues and in particular housing. I think that workforce housing is really critical to the economic growth in our city and we were as a council very pleased to um, 
to approve a couple of projects that were purpose-built uh, rental housing recently, which, as you know, has been a long time in coming. So uh, we're uh, also undergoing an affordable housing strategy that will look at ways uh, to make sure that we protect affordable housing stock. So thank you so much for um, taking the time to pay attention to that. I think it's important for any business um, uh, case. I guess the other thing is keeping up with our infrastructure needs, and I think that's really important. And as we um, as we grow as a city, we need to make sure that we have enough rec centers, ice rinks, etc. And I think, um, thank you, uh, the business community really has a good sense of what that means in terms of bringing uh, the community or growing a city. So thank you for those comments. Councillor Villeneuve. Thank you very much. And I echo the past two speakers for um, the work that you've done hand in hand with the city. But I also want to acknowledge and say that I'm really looking forward to your new five-year initiative. Uh, uh, Anita Huberman chairs the local immigrant partnership with myself and about 30 people around the table. And I'm, I'm really um, looking forward to the results of the efforts that you're making to connect uh, new immigrants to employers because I think that's one of the most important steps um, in our city is to get people connected to employment as well as to be jump-starting employment because they then become connected and uh, taxable uh, residents within the city. So I applaud those efforts and really would look forward to some reporting in the future about some successes or where some of the barriers are or how the city could help you with those endeavors. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, uh, Anita, for your presentation. It's always nice when you come here because it is, uh, we look at it as partners in building a city, and your comments have, uh, have always been both valuable and uh, constructive. So I thank you for that approach. Um, I, I'm also aware that you're sitting on the, as a part of the steering committee for a regional prosperity initiative. And I think that that offers us another opportunity to talk about the things that are occurring at that table and what where the city may have some uh, uh, ideas and approaches that you can also uh, regionally uh, deliver the same kind of message that we're delivering. Um, and, and I know for one thing that uh, most recently they're talking about the film industry, so I'd like to further that discussion with you at some point in time. But uh, it would also be very helpful if the community, the business community, delivers the message around what this is actually costing um, individual businesses and individual residents as opposed to the percentages. We get a lot of conversation around what is the percentage increase, but our percentage of of 1% brings in a couple of million dollars. An equal percentage increase in Vancouver brings in something like six million dollars. So they could have a 2% increase and get more money than we would f fundamentally get at a 4% increase. So actually understanding what that, val what that dollar value is, is a really helpful message uh, to the community at large. And I, I particularly appreciate your comment that maybe being at the bottom of the rung is not the best place to be. It is where we were placed as a result of a decade of zero, but it is fundamentally with a city our size and the growth that we're experiencing and the needs that we know are there is probably not the best place for us to be. But it is a very difficult needle to move, as you can appreciate, uh, um, within the context of both social media and media. So the more we work together to deliver that message, I think the better off we'll all be ultimately. So thank you very much for your positive presentation today. Thank, thank you, you, Madam Mayor. Council Starcheck. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I need a great presentation. I just want to make sure it goes noticed uh, that agriculture has a place within the, the Surrey Board of Trade in the sense of how we want to get the the use out of the land that's out there and try to find an innovative way uh, to get those people motivated to, to utilize that, that property in the best way that they can. And even more importantly, to see the reference to climate change and the needs for water somewhere down the future. So I'm glad to see that included in your report. Thank you. So once again, we have no other questions. So again, once again, thank you very much for your presentation. 
And I'm going to call upon the public once again. Do we have any other members of the public who wish to make any comments on our operating agreement? I'm sorry, our operating budget. First call, second call, third and final call. Deb, you'll be our last speaker. <coughs> And in fact, it was Deb who asked me five years ago, Tom, is it really the best thing to be, um, to have the, be the lowest taxed uh, municipality in the, the lower mainland? I said, Deb, you're probably right. We probably need to be somewhere in that last quartile. And I still can't get out being the last one right now, Deb. So I just want to take that opportunity of saying that because you did ask me a, a very challenging question, but I just, just can't seem to be last. Yeah, but be I, last. Oh, someone's pen? I was sitting there, I admit, thinking there is no virtue in being the lowest. <laughs> um, Madam Clerk, I have copy for everybody. Yeah. Uh, I apologize for not being early enough, but we got snow out there. And I want to make a private um, comment on behalf of myself and my neighbors. I live in a cul-de-sac which is on a steep hill on the side of a hill off which you have to go down Little Hill. And in the past we've often with snowy winters not had any clearing at all which put a pretty much onus on all of us to try to clear ways to be able to get out. Indeed, I do recall and was thinking of that day when a garbage truck got stuck because of the amount of ice that had built up. Since the brine has been used on the roads, we get cleared even though we're a tertiary street. And I can't tell you how helpful that is. And I just thought I'd mention that there are a group of people who are quite appreciative it's enough that we have to tackle our driveways, but man, it's nice to have that road being able to get up that little hill. It's short, but it's steep. I appreciate those comments too, Deb. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I, yeah, that's the only um, connection I can think of. It's just when the brining came, which means I guess that less time has to be spent on the main roads. Um, and so it facilitates everybody else. I'm sure other tertiary road dwellers have the same kinds of feelings. I am Deb Jack, President of Surrey Environmental Partners. Thank you very much, Mayor and Council as Finance Committee. We appreciate the opportunity for input into the financial plan for 2017-2021. Surrey Environmental Partners is a non-profit society and member of the Federation BC Nature. Our main activities are education and advocacy with a primary focus on Surrey. Our vision is a community where nature will flourish. This is our 11th submission to Finance Committee for consideration and recommendations for City financial plans. The recommendations arise from observations and concerns from citizens who are staunch supporters of Surrey and who wish to have the natural areas component of it as extensive and healthy as possible, with special emphasis on forest ecosystems, wetlands, riparian areas and fields, which probably covers everything in our city's natural world. The issue of water has been a long-standing concern since our first submission. Number one, Surrey needs to have an aquifer vulnerability study done of all aspects of the Brookswood, Brookswood aquifer and areas south of 16th Avenue, which are being reviewed for alternative land use. At the time of Campbell Heights development, the aquifer was designated highest vulnerability in the BC aquifer classification system. At the time, concerns were expressed by the then Envi Environmental Advisory Committee. Groundwater was dealt with by the Auditor General's report of 2010, with the Lower Fraser Valley, of which Surrey is a significant part, being at the top of the 20 priority areas for aquifer characterization. The Little Campbell River, subject to so much impact from developments on both sides of the municipal border, requires assessment of ecosystem viability, groundwater recharge and service groundwater re exchange data in a fine grade integrated process. That was addressed to Council at the submission of the Little Campbell Watershed Society on the 12th, 21st of November on the capital component of the financial plan. Number two, 
We have very real concerns for the integrity of our riparian watersheds as well as setback areas. We've observed near constant reduction of riparian setbacks from the expected standards which developed to ensure health of watercourses, fishes and other riparian life in development applications. Indeed, we have seen one submission proposing zero at a spot. Watersheds are vastly compromised by being covered up by buildings, asphalt and concrete resulting in riparian areas being constantly chipped away in a piecemeal manner. It may well be that it is time to step back and have a thorough assessment of each river and its watershed to determine the overall health and viability for the long term. It is not known if stormwater management plans are sufficient for this purpose. It also seems to be sensible to do when an aquifer vulnerability study is being done. Three, the serpentine hatchery people observe the serpentine to rise two plus feet at times of heavy rains. This gives rise to concerns of riverbed integrity regarding scoury, implications for fish survival, and so on. Four, once again, we express our concern that the Biodiversity Conservation Program has not yet been finalized as to program organization. We have made a recommendation considering that location in the Engineering Division Environmental Manager's Unit would be most appropriate. We have suggested that there be an ongoing consultation committee with representatives from the various divisions and appropriate units to ensure consistent application of the BCP principles and intent throughout the city. Ongoing, the issue of lost BC gin appropriate lands is of paramount concern. We have suggested varying funding possibilities for specific acquisitions. Apparently, a legacy fund can be resourced. Clearly, to manage the BCP and all its facets adequately, there would need to be additional staffing. The city should also have another in its, its own designated RP bio, that's a registered professional biologist, to act for city welfare as direct consultant to planners and to assist dealing with developers on BCS related issues including riparian setbacks under the new zoning regulations. Number five, we've heard citizens objecting to watering boulevard trees during the very hot summers we're experiencing now due to cost. Perhaps some type of incentive program could be considered. Six, there is concern about how trees are planted by the city. In order for healthy, good growing trees to be possible, there needs to be good appropriate soil and adequate space for root development. Some trees simply do not seem to be growing, hence the concern. Are the holes being dug for the trees on boulevards and medians big enough and deep enough for healthy trees for our canopy? In passing by some median developments, for example, it does not appear so. Seven, we continue to ask that there be a range of fees for trees cut down beyond the standard $400 per tree, whether or not the tree is the basic 12 inches in diameter or 36 inches, and a range of replacements required according to original tree size. I was interested to read in a local Abbotsford paper that their fee is $546 for every 12 inches in diameter. It's unknown if proration for lesser units is, accried, is um, facilitated. And instead of our standard one-to-one -one or two-to-one replacement, they require no replacement for killed trees under 20 centimeters, and two-for-one for trees 20 to 30 centimeters, and three trees for 30 centimeters or more. I was unable to contact anybody at Abbotsford to get specifics on this, but it was in a local Abbotsford newspaper on the issue of trees. Really, Surrey should want to be at the head of the municipalities in this matter. Eight, previously we have requested that the SNAP program be expanded. We are now requesting that the period of activity be extended into the shoulder months to do planting and continue to remove invasives, which unfortunately do not take time off from evading and insidiously encroaching on our natural areas. Nine, some years ago, we addressed the idea of decentralizing the delivery of Surrey Park's natural education programs from the Nature Centre to various other parts of the city, at the time proposing delivery in the South Surrey area. We would like that to be considered. It is important programming of which we have been very much in support over the years. Indeed, education is important activity of many of our partner groups, engaging and educating thousands of children and adults in Surrey's natural aspects, particularly marine and riverine. These programs complement those of Surrey Parks Department, which are excellent. Ten. 
Some time ago, SEP observed that Surrey did not have and required a wildlife protection bylaw to include full habitat conservation. This is still needed to facilitate BCP principles implementation and fulfill sustainability charter intentions. 11. Once again, we request that consideration be given to expanding the staff numbers of Surrey the staff number Surrey has to directly care for its natural areas and to monitor contracted services. The more BCP and parks natural lands we acquire, the greater the need to properly husband them. 12. We are suggesting that Surrey needs a different category of staff for monitoring and administering its natural areas. We have two preserves, which are no dogs allowed, and a number of eco-sensitive areas, for example, the Savanai area of Blackie Spit, which do and will require closer care than is possible under the bylaws system. For want of a better word, we suggest forest or parks ranger, serving only the natural areas on a consistent year-round basis, which could provide education information and emphasis, emphasize adherence to city regulations and policies. With the weather, weather patterns changing, the need for this kind of a programming on the part of special staff is year-round. 13. No net loss is a continuing policy request that there be no net loss of natural areas when park converts such lands to other purposes, that other natural areas be acquired for replacement. 14. City Centre was proposed by Bing Tom to have 10,000 trees planted to soften harsh surfaces visually and provide canopy for cooling and comfort purposes enticing people to stay. We wonder what has happened to that plan if it has been retained. 15. Finally, the issue of information and education signs in and around natural areas. Some partner groups are experienced in this and willing to assist. It is terrific to listen to people and children happening upon good signage that explains what they are seeing and its importance. An excellent example is the treatment Semiamu Fish and Game Club have implemented at their Forest River Walk. I highly commend this if none of you have been there. To put into perspective the concerns and hopes of SEP and everyone in Surrey who cares about natural areas and our rivers, creeks and streams and the future of them, I came across this. Over 2,000 years ago, Plato, Plato wrote in Critias of deforestation and resulting soil erosion. 2,000 years ago. There are problems with growing trees which still affects that part of the world to this day. We want to ensure that Surrey has done the best which can be done to acquire, conserve and maintain healthy natural areas for everyone into the future. So no one looks back and says how foolish we were. We won't have an excuse, we really do know better. Thank you for the opportunity to again have input into the city budgeting process. We remain available to assist wherever possible and regard our position as a stakeholder for city proposals and plans seriously. Respectfully submitted. Are there any questions? Thank you, Deb, and thank you for being so committed to come out each and every year and uh, providing your thoughts. Do we have any comments from council members? Seeing none, Deb? Oh, Councillor Hain. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And Deb, thank you very much. And as always, very thoughtful. And uh, I think perhaps this year, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, there seem to be uh, even more specific uh, uh, requests or specific recommendations uh, in your report uh, than ever before. And I would certainly like to um, ask staff to, um, to, to, to take a look at this and perhaps come back to us okay. in, in a shirt sleeve or come back to us uh, in some form. Uh, to hear their comments on uh, on many of these recommendations because I think uh, I don't I really don't want to just you know I, I want to capture them I don't want them to be lost so I'd really uh, appreciate if staff could look at these in the various departments uh, parks and planning and engineering and then and come back to us with uh, with their thoughts on these so thanks very much thank you councillor Frank mr. chair thank you so much Deb um, what a great presentation, and I would Thank agree you. with uh, Councillor Hain that um, it's. It, I, I appreciate that you brought forward very specific recommendations. That's and what we tried of, for this year. And some of these seem really doable, and so it, it would be great if we could have staff look at them and see what we can actually implement. And I do want to just um, take a moment to thank you for your um, diligence in coming to council for the past two years that um, I've been on council. You've really, you know, you come here at every meeting and you make sure that you hear, um, that we hear what 
uh, the environmental needs of the community are, and I really appreciate that. So thank, thank you. you. And finally, Deb, I can certainly suggest to you that even today, this morning, we had a short sleeve session and many of your recommendations that you speak of did come up in the context of discussion. So hopefully we can build upon your comments and your words. So thank you very much for coming out today. Thank you. And if there's any amplification needed for our position on any of these things, more than happy to participate or respond. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, folks, we're going to move into uh, corporate reports, item F006. If I could have someone move the recommendations. I'll move. Seconder. And we've got comments, so Councillor Hain, you're first up. And my comments, well, I've got a, a, a question and then a, a quick comment. Uh, my question comes in uh, under new funding requirements uh, 4.1 uh, under RCMP policing services. And uh, it struck me that... Um, uh, the, the, well, there's a couple of line items. One is the uh, integrated, the uh, additional funding for integrated teams at, uh, at uh, 900,000, and then uh, right below that, the increased funding for E-Division administration at uh, almost $2 million. And um, if, if that's uh, staffing level increases or, or salary increases, I noticed like the salary increase, for instance, for, for all of Surrey Detachment is, uh, is only only a uh, million dollars. And so uh, looking at two point, you know, two million dollars for uh, E-Division, which is a shared, uh, a shared service, obviously, with, with every municipality in the province that, that uses RCMP, um, is, this a, is this a trend that we should be planning for? Um, I don't recall what last year's line item was in that regard, so um, it, it just seems to be quite high. And is that an anomaly or is that something that we're going to have to look for uh, going forward? And then I have a comment after that quickly. Uh, yeah, through the chair to Councillor Hain, um, certainly that is a very significant uh, figure, 1.9 million. Uh, the E-Division um, um, costs are driven by the federal government and ultimately it's based on a formula that, um, uh, that is driven by the number of members that we have as a city. Um, I believe the most current figure is $24,000 per member needs to be contributed toward E-Division and that includes costs for uh, both staffing, the building itself, the operations of all the 6,000 plus members that are at E-Division um, <clears throat> and also members on sick leave. Um, I don't think it's um, uh, it, uh, anomaly probably isn't the right word. Um, I think this is probably an incremental change, but the magnitude of the change is such that it's something that we need to be abreast of, uh, but we do have very little control over it though. I realize that, yeah. Okay. And just Quickly, Mr. Chair, my comment was uh, on uh, is on uh, the same uh, 4.1, but number three under uh, the bylaw officers. Very pleased to see three new bylaw officers, um, and I would just encourage if there's any way to to move them up from June till sooner than that, I'd be supportive of that. <laughs> Thank, Thank you for those comments. Those Councilor. are my comments. Councilor Bill. Uh, just following up on the comment of the bylaw officers, can you tell me, uh, with the additional three bylaw officers, how many bylaw officers we'll have in place then? Um, I Is believe, that? and I think the manager of bylaws will probably be able to respond to this better. I believe we're at 55 bylaw officers on a full time basis. Yes. Approximately 55. 55. Thank you. And I was just going to um, ask about uh, this one. I know that we've had the downloaded costs, but the 2017 proposed financial plan includes the DNA analysis costs that the province uh, downloaded onto municipalities. And for 2017, this expenditure is budgeted at $469,000, which represents a $159,000 um, lift from the 2016 adopted financial plan. Uh, so I, I just thought that was quite a lot of money uh, to be lifted in one year. First of all, we, we now have to burden those costs, and now we have that almost $160,000 increase in one year. So are you expecting that to go up each year, or is there some way we can play an advocacy role with the province being in a, in a good financial position now to take on that responsibility again? Yes, through the chair to Councillor Villeneuve. Um, certainly that is a significant figure. Um, the downloading, downloading commenced last year. 
um, incrementally increasing 160 for 2017. Um, the information that we've been provided by the provinces, uh, we should be expecting another increase of approximately 80 to 100,000 for 2018. And at that point, um, the information thus far is that it will stabilize at that level, uh, but there is no guarantees. And uh, what, what was their justification for the downloading? I'm, I know we discussed this a while back, but I'm just trying to refresh my memory. Uh, the justification is not very clear, to be honest. Uh, through the Mayor's Consultative Forum with the RCMP in the province, uh, we've asked that question. Um, it was agreement between the province and the federal government. Um, at this point, I would say it's still an active concern from all municipalities and something that we're still pursuing, getting clarity in terms of why it was done and if it is permanent, in fact. And are you working with someone, another body, to try and get that clarification or another city? Are you working... Yes. The UBCM working on it. UBCM is also involved in this issue, um, as well as um, through the conduit of the Mayor's Consultative Forum. Okay. I think it's important to pursue that. So, and uh, there's the report I, I thought was, um, uh, was excellent and clear, <laughs> which I always appreciate. And the uh, analysis of about $100 per household um, tax increase. And can you just uh, remind me, is it $760,000, the average cost of the home, or 840? It's actually 720,000. 720,000. Thank you. Well, I got them for you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Madam Mayor. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yes, that's an ongoing uh, discussion, that fee with the, uh, with the Mayor's Council and the Lower Mainland uh, District Policing Table. And I'm surprised that there is no real rationale, but there isn't. So uh, I was going to ask the same question as Councillor Hain relative to the increased cost of funding for the uh, E-Division because uh, the very next line also shows the contract increases relative to the IT as I understand it and for vehicles. So the increased cost for E-Division is strictly on the personnel level, right? Because they're not actually trying to build in the cost of construction of that building, are they? In some yes, Madam Mayor, the nefarious cost. way, this is about maintaining the building but not paying for the cost of the building. Yeah, that is another contentious issue at this point. Um, the, the costs include operations of the building and as well as financial payments toward the building. Um, uh, and again, it's driven by the number of members that we have, so strictly correlated to the increase in members is the increase in that E-Division cost. Um, Mr. City Manager, it's, we're still, um, along with the rest of the, uh, the Lower Mainland, suggesting that that E-Division building is not ours to pay for, are we not? Uh, Madam Mayor, because the uh, E-Division building was built under a P3 with the Government of Canada, so it's, it's pretty much operating costs every year that, that cover the building, the maintenance of the building, the long-term interests of the building, and so it's a whole package. Um, I would echo that um, we are diligent in advocating for uh, more control on these costs, especially the ones we don't control and, and that are escalating. And so we use all the forums available, be it the consultation with the RCMP through the mayor's forums or UBCM or any other forum that it comes. And uh, just to clarify, the other line item is for IHIT uh, and in the integrated teams and not IT. Yes, I understand it's the integrated teams. Um, and I had one question just further to the bylaw officers, and that is that we're not getting those bylaws officers in until June of the middle of next, to the middle of next year. Does that affect us in providing those four officers on the ground 24-7 relative to the Surrey outreach team? Uh, through the Chair, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, no, that would not affect. It would be a seamless operation in terms of the community patrol. Um, there would be no disruption in terms of that. So we have enough officers to, to do the regular bylaw duties um, until June when we get the three new officers? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Mr. City Manager, did you have anything to add? That's good. And we're going to move to Councillor Steele. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, again, with regards to RCMP, um, has any, been, any consideration been given this year to the um, when the RCMP forces will unionize? 
and if this is going to be retroactive to this year or how much that's going to cost us at all. Uh, through the chair, uh, Councillor Steele, uh, in relation to um, escalating salary costs, um, the federal government has given us a benchmark of 2.5% per year, which we are um, accounting for. However, I cannot speak to the status of the unionization of the membership. Okay, I understand that that agreement is, is meant to be coming out fairly early in 2017, so just, just curious. We're going to move to Councillor Starcheck now. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just wanted to say thanks to uh, Suzanne for uh, explaining some of the, the process and protocols that are here and, and listening to that calculator going in the background uh, changed my entire entire day. Um, <laughs> with regards to um, bylaws, I just want to make sure because I, I also want to um, bring it forward that, you know, June is... You know, I know it's for budgeting portions. It's it's later on in the year, and if there's a way that it can be moved up a little bit quicker. But um, just two questions: like, first and foremost, those are bylaw enforcement officers. That is correct. And with regards to the the, the question that was there before us, where we asked, that, I think it was Councillor Villeneuve that asked about the number of uh, staff that were there. When we talked about 58, are we talking about that's the entire staff, or are we talking about is that the bylaws officers that we actually have that are out there? I believe that is just the bylaw officers, not inclusive of support staff. Okay, great. thank you. We're going to move to Councillor Witts. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to be clear, and, and although I, I know that other, many other municipalities, including the City of Surrey, feels that E Division building uh, is not their responsibility or any sums to it, the fact of the matter is, is that sooner or later we may have to contribute to that. Does this budget here have any component where we're setting some money aside in case that scenario actually happens? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Woods, yes, uh, we are setting an allocation aside in the event that does happen. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have another question. I'm sorry. Please. Yes, um, also, um, uh, um, I, I did delve into this uh, last week with um, uh, Ms. Fillion, and uh, I know that the 900,000 uh, for the integrated teams, there's, when the, many people think of the integrated teams, they think it's just I hit. But there's a huge component in there, and that's forensic. Um, out of that 900,000, how much is the increase in the forensic? Because I know that Great strides are being made in scientific um, ways of solving crime, but they're expensive. Through the chair to Councillor Woods, um, we can certainly get back to you on the details of the split between the integrated teams. Um, in fact, there's six integrated teams that make up that 900,000, including police dogs, for example, forensic, I hit, and three others. Um, so that's something we can we can get back to you on shortly. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Councillor LaFranc. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. So last year, um, I, I did express some concern about the $100 capital levy not being integrated into our um, general tax base. And I would like to, at some point this evening, take that uh, forward as a motion to be treated in much the same way that we treated the 0.54% uh, increase to the capital levy. But that capital levy be um, uh, inter both integrated into our uh, tax base, but also uh, segregated so that it's treated as the capital levy. So I'm not sure what the correct protocol is, Mr. Chair, but I'd like to make that motion. So, Councillor Frank, I understand that the recommendations that we are speaking to are really what we have. We've got two recommendations on the table. Okay. Um, so speaking to that, if you want to make a recommendation, I'd be pleased to have you entertain that. So I think for purposes of getting through this corporate report. I'm going to call the question, seeing that there are no other questions. So I will call the question on corporate report F006. We'll agree. Anybody contrary? Seeing none, I will Excuse pass. me, um, Sorry? Mr. Chairman. Yes. I don't think that was put onto the table in the first place. I think yes. Councillor Hain had moved it. And, oh, thank uh, you. Second. Yeah. So the second. Okay. Thank you. So I'll call the question on corporate report F006. All in favor? Good. Against and carried. 
So, Councillor Frank, now we can come back to your issue, and you are suggesting that uh, the Finance Committee reconsider the existing capital levy, yes. uh, just in the context of uh, uh, the report that we had last week. Uh, we reviewed the capital plan at that time, and I believe, Madam Clerk, if you could just enlighten me, or perhaps Cam or, or Suzanne, that the context of the previous report was to maintain the $100, correct? And at that time, we decided not to increase that capital levy by $10. In fact, we decided to maintain the $100 and increase the capital levy by 0.54, and that was somehow to be shown on, on uh, as a restricted fund, which you have shown today. So that's kind of the, the background and the history that's of where correct. we're at. So perhaps, uh, just, just to, if, if I may, just to my colleagues, um, I'm not sure if it would be appropriate for us to do the motion now, or alternatively, we can have staff give us some direction in terms of the historical part, which we have approved. And my only concern is that we did uh, approve uh, the to maintain the capital of E just less than a week ago. So that's my, my only concern so, I have. So I'm not... May I? Okay. I'm not suggesting we don't keep the capital levy. I'm suggesting that we treat it differently. So um, again, that would uh, the the implications there are pretty significant. I'm going to perhaps suggest that we. There's a seconder. I can I can have. Is there a seconder to the motion? I'll, I'll second it for discussion, and I have a question. Sure. Um, just just for clarification, you're looking at not in this particular budget, but in the next year's budget, right? To look at viewing it differently. So I made that recommendation last year, and I'm, I'm happy to make it again this year. Um, but I would like to see it uh, transferred into our general. Um, tax budget. So just for clarification, in this particular budget or in the... I would year? prefer in this budget. That was the motion I made. Okay. So, thank you. so do I have anybody else wanting to speak to the motion? <coughs> Seeing no other speakers, I'll call the question on the motion. All in favor? Against? So it is a denial. So. But, but I do think that just in, in the context of the question, I, I certainly do think that it would be wise if we could have staff uh, provide the, uh, the Finance Committee with some numbers in terms of what that would translate it to if, in fact, that was the direction of the committee. Uh, whether you need to do that by memorandum or should you wish to bring a corporate report, I'll leave that in your discretion. But, but certainly just having that information available would be very important just to understand what the tax implications would be for both a, an average single family and more particularly as it would relate to some of the new multifamily that we have, whether it's a condo or a townhouse, because I do think that the, the implications are, are very significant. Mr. City Manager. bring uh, forward to council by memo the calculation because we and but we can also bring it back when we start building the 2018 budget uh, coming in in May or June we can bring it back at that time but we in the meantime we'll provide the information excellent thank you sir all right if I could have someone move adjournment so moved. Seconder. 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 call the question all in favor against carried thank you folks